Cyberpunk got path tracing today, or full ray tracing, or RT Overdrive. It has three names, but they all mean the same thing. And that update is what brings an RTX 4090 down to 20 FPS average in our testing when running at 4K with path tracing without the help of DLSS. And uh, for reasons that make sense, CD Projekt Red and NVIDIA are both very sensitive about the fact that this is a technology preview. And at first we weren't sure why specifically CDPR was so sensitive about it being a technology preview, but then my testing team started vandalizing our test benches with this. But it is actually a pretty big move because previously the only games that have been fully ray traced, fully path traced, have been Quake 2, which is from 1997. We just looked at it for a 3D FX Voodoo card review. Go watch it if you haven't seen it. But Quake 2, not quite the same caliber as Cyberpunk graphically. Uh, Minecraft, same thing, very low poly. The lowest poly, in fact. And uh, additionally, Portal, the remake. And they don't really count when comparing to Cyberpunk here. So uh, the graphics in those games are extremely basic. DLSS here is basically necessary, and so is frame generation to make Cyberpunk with path tracing work. But it is, in fact, a really cool tech preview. So today we're benchmarking full path tracing or ray tracing or RT overdrive, whatever they call it. And we'll also be looking at DLSS, frame gen, uh, and image quality all on an RTX 4090. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake and their new Series 500TG ARGB mid-tower case. The Thermaltake series case is perforated all on the front panel and the power supply shroud, including perforations on the cable side of the case for further ventilation to the PSU and hard drive chamber of the case. A separate access door for hard drives makes the case easy to work with for 3.5 inch storage, or the door can be swapped out for a separate LCD panel kit that displays system information. Other features include a GPU support kit, vertical mounting, and a hinged glass panel. Learn more at the link in the description below. This piece should be pretty fun for everyone because we've included a lot of recaps and explainers for things like frame gen, DLSS, DLSS3, what exactly that means, and uh, of course path tracing and ray tracing. We have uh, some quotes in here as well from NVIDIA staff, so it should be educational in that regard. Now, Cyberpunk already had ray tracing, so CDPR notes that the primary areas you should expect to see this update impact things will be opaque surfaces and shadows, specifically. And it also doesn't affect everything, which we'll get to that later. So previously, opaque surfaces, as we understand it, only had one uh, traced ray, and CDPR still had to fetch GI probes, and they still had to fetch reflection probes. But now, CDPR is able to bounce once, and then another time, to reduce the requirement of fetching probe data. And the end result is that only opaques end up in the G-buffer, whereas transparencies render later in the pipeline. But first in its purest definition, path tracing is defined just simply via Wikipedia as the following, quote, path tracing is a computer graphics Monte Carlo method of rendering images of three-dimensional scenes such that the global illumination is faithful to reality. When combined with physically accurate models of surfaces, accurate models of real light sources, and optically correct cameras, Path tracing can produce still images that are indistinguishable from photograph. Path tracing naturally simulates many effects that have to be specifically added to other methods, conventional ray tracing or scan line rendering, such as soft shadows, depth of field, motion blur, caustics, ambient occlusion, and indirect lighting. So the main things here, this is a step towards more bounces, for one, which means in theory more accuracy, but also a lot more load. Uh, and additionally, it's a step towards a, a theoretical infinite amount of lights that can uh, not just be rendered in, but have effect on the surrounding elements within the scene or the view frustum of the player. So that's what's receiving the ray tracing treatment here rather than a maybe limited number of lights or a limited type of materials uh, within the scene. But in the case of this one, path tracing doesn't change everything. So particles and glass surfaces still use the previous methods. Those You shouldn't look for changes there. There are none. There's also still a lot of manual work involved in integrating the path tracing update with Cyberpunk, because it's bolted on after the fact. And the result of that is that you already have artists who have spent countless hours manually tuning the scene with traditional rendering methods, not ray tracing or path tracing. And so the game, uh, in some areas, may look better without path tracing or ray tracing than with them. And that's because of the manual tuning. Uh, this stuff would work better if it were from the start. but. This game you know, entered development a long time ago. So uh, NVIDIA specifically said on a hardware level, it is now relying heavily on SER, 
or shader execution reordering. This is something we talked about with the Ada Lovelace architecture launch, but to uh, bring it back up, uh, in combination with DLSS, SER is what's making this full ray tracing possible on the 4090, then basically nothing else. Uh, but the company said this to us, quote, in compute, the GPU is its most effective if all the threads in that group execute the same code. If not, we have to serialize them. If half the threads execute shader A and half execute shader B, it takes a time of execution of A plus B to complete the workload. Thinking of path tracing and tracing rays in different directions, there's a high likelihood of them hitting different materials, subsurface, foliage, and reflective surfaces. If you hit different materials, then you multiply the direction time by the number of materials you hit and the number of threads in the group. This conversation continued for a while, but they then said, instead, right when you execute the closest hit shader, you sort the entire screen so that all the threads that hit a standard material are in one group, all that hit another material are in another group, then we process it all at once. And this, by the way, was an awesome discussion to have because uh, it gets into more of the engineering of, like, we heard about SER, Jensen talked about it on stage, this is kind of a real-world use case, and that's always cool to hear about. And Cyberpunk, the areas of most impact are going to be sun, uh, moon, local lights, emissives, and skylights. That's where you'll see it. There's uh, affecting the things we talked about earlier. But enough of the introductory information. And as a reminder, uh, CDPR was very clear in publicizing everywhere on their channels, like YouTube, whatever, that this is a technology preview. And uh, because they are so heavy-handed and saying that we want to make sure everyone else is aware because fair enough, they're not selling the update. So uh, we'll look at it from a technology standpoint. Time to get on to the benchmarks. We'll start with just path tracing benchmarks across all three major resolutions. This chart won't include normal ray tracing, but the next one will. Here, we're just going to look at path tracing's impact on frame rate for 1080, 1440, and 4K. And here's the chart. This one contains one result without path tracing that's tested at 4K, and that result ends up outperforming every other result on this chart. But it makes sense. There's no path tracing. At 76 FPS average and with lows at 56 and 49, the 4K test is in acceptable territory on the 4090. Enabling path tracing at 4K without the help of DLSS pushes it down to 20 FPS average with lows proportionally but objectively low. It's truly an unplayable experience. Moving around at this frame rate, you can't really see anything. It's just a big blurry mess, and it feels pretty awful to play. DLSS is basically required, and that's one of the next charts. But if you were adamantly against DLSS and frame generation, then 1440p or 1080p would be the next most obvious options. 1440p increases the average to 41 FPS, with lows at 34 and 32. 1080p, with, again, path tracing on, allows the path trace rendition of Cyberpunk to climb to 65 FPS average. It's not bad, and it's back in playable territory, certainly, but it's still below 4K without any RT features whatsoever. And, of course, this is 1080p on an RTX 4090, so that just feels kind of bad anyway. Next up is a frame time plot. These plots give us an empirical frame-to-frame -frame look at performance in the most representative way possible with numbers, for the gaming experience. First, we're plotting the path tracing results without any help from DLSS. This is a worst case scenario. This line runs extremely high. It's unplayable with frame times of about 50 milliseconds plus or minus 10. The most important thing though, and what we're actually looking for, is that it doesn't have any massive spikes away from the previous frame or the mean. And this is actually impressive. We're not seeing anything skyrocket to say 120 milliseconds. So while the experience is bad, it's at least consistently bad, and that is a good thing, oddly enough. It's still unplayable, though. Getting rid of path tracing and moving to the older ray tracing implementation on Ultra, we saw frame times closer to 25 milliseconds, and this with all other graphics settings controlled. They're still extremely consistent with no major spikes up or down. Finally, turning DLSS quality on with frame generation enabled and using the new path tracing option gives us a line closer to the 60 FPS mark, or about 16.7 milliseconds. Once again, there are no major frame time excursions. So at least in this one aspect, Cyberpunk and NVIDIA, for their part, they're doing well to keep the frame times consistent. And that's the most important part. Our next bar chart is with variations on ray tracing and path tracing, all tested at 4K resolution here as a baseline, with DLSS still off. 
We'll enable it for the next chart though. These conditions control for all variables at this point, except for the lighting rendering mode, which is the main thing under test. And here's the chart. Of course, DLSS off and RT off post the best result on this chart. The next is with RT set to ultra, producing a 40 FPS average result. That allows the RT off result an 89% improvement over the RT ultra result. Switching RT to ultra using psycho ray traced lighting, we drop another four FPS from the average and about the same amount from the 1% 0.1% lows. Switching to full path tracing though, the result is that 20 FPS number we talked about for the average with lows at 17 for 1% and 16 for 0.1%. That means that enabling path tracing costs about 50% of the performance against just ray tracing, or 74% of the performance of the like-for-like -like test without ray tracing at 76 FPS average. To phrase that another way, the DLSS and ray tracing off result, the one at 76 FPS average, is 283% faster than the path trace result in a like-for-like -like scenario. The next chart will enable DLSS, but we want to do some explanation here because there are a few important factors that people frequently overlook. And also, DLSS 3 is still kind of new. So in addition to DLSS on versus off, ray tracing and path tracing variables, we also have the new DLSS frame generation variable within Cyberpunk. This will be represented in charts as FG on or FG off. All of the tests are at 4K baseline, but DLSS changes the actual base resolution, so let's go over that. DLSS has five primary modes, ultra quality, quality, balance, performance, and custom. Not every mode will be in every game. So for example, some games like Cyberpunk have an ultra performance mode as well. All modes except custom behave the same way between games. This simple table shows the scale factor for NVIDIA DLSS modes. NVIDIA defines quality as a 66.7% scaling factor, which means that a 1440p input resolution becomes a 4K output resolution. Similarly, a 1706 by 960 input becomes 2560 by 1440, and 1280 by 720 becomes 1920 by 1080. Balanced is a 59% scale, which means that 4K output becomes 2259 by 1271 and sort of real, so to speak, pixels drawn. Performance is at a 50% scale, so 4K now actually becomes 1920 by 1080 input resolution. And that's because, as a reminder, 4K isn't 2 times 1080, but rather 4 times 1080. Now to spend some time explaining the new frame generation. This is important to understand anyway, whether or not you're using it in Cyberpunk. This relatively new feature is what CDPR and NVIDIA were both extremely touchy about. They seem aware that the game is functionally unplayable without it, and they really wanted to make sure that everyone understands it's present. But here's how it works. DLSS 3 is capable of generating new frames entirely independently of the CPU and the game engine itself by totally synthesizing the frames on the GPU alone. This is achieved by analyzing the rendered frames with the Ada Optical Flow Accelerator. So we'll start by explaining a simplified version of the standard graphics pipeline. Canonically, the game engine establishes the required operations for the frame, so things like physics and draw calls. Then the CPU executes those operations, and once it has the draw calls ready, it places them in the render queue, which acts as a buffer between the CPU and the GPU. While this is happening, the GPU is constantly taking the oldest draw call data in the render queue, rendering it as a completed frame to pass onto the display, and getting more draw call data from the render queue. Necessary to DLSS 3's operation is removal of the standard render queue from the pipeline as leaving it in place would result in too much latency while adding the process of generating new frames. If you were to simply remove the render queue, the latency would go down, but the GPU would spend time waiting without work as the CPU does other things, like physics, before getting to draw calls. CPU and GPU work isn't inherently synchronized, and since demand varies from frame to frame, the frame times could be very inconsistent. Now that we've explained how DLSS 3 is, in theory, streamlining the graphics pipeline, we can talk about the frame generation that takes place between each rendered frame. Frame analysis is performed as a joint effort between Ada's tensor cores and Optical Flow Accelerator, which run multiple AI models per frame to examine both game geometry vectors and optical flow vectors. Optical flow is a search to find how pixels in one image correlate to pixels in a subsequent image. NVIDIA previously said this is an ill-posed problem, 
and the answer is not clearly defined. That's from their original announcement because they say not all pixels will be correlated between the images. And we can see a visual representation of that flow in this set of images from Cyberpunk. Note how the motorcycle and the rider aren't moving relative to the camera, but the scenery, especially at the edges, is moving a great deal. If you were to only use motion vectors from the game engine, you end up with bad artifacts like what NVIDIA showed in this set of images. The rider's shadow, for example, jumping around on the road as the player moves forward. This is because the game geometry vectors tell us that ground is moving backwards relative to the camera, and therefore anything on it should be as well. In order to avoid this, optical flow analysis is necessary, especially for ray traced effects. Game geometry vectors and optical flow vectors are different, and they sometimes disagree. But both are correct in their own ways. The data is blended in the DLSS3 AI models to reconstruct and generate the final inserted frames. And while this sounds great, generating new frames by referencing actually rendered frames could theoretically result in lower image quality. You're faking stuff at some level, so of course that's the possible outcome. NVIDIA is essentially, though, sidestepping both CPU and engine bottlenecks to throw all of this work onto the GPU. By the time all this frame generation is done, DLSS3 is generating up to 87.5% of the displayed pixels in an extreme case. DLSS3 is a combination of super resolution, reflex, and frame generation, and that combination is only able to work on the 40 series because the 40 series is the only one with the optical flow physical hardware for frame generation. It's new to Ada Lovelace GPUs. Enough of the explainer, let's move forward to that chart. Here's the full chart with everything we tested in the last day, finally. So with DLSS set to quality and with frame generation on with ray tracing set to ultra, we landed at 106 FPS average when the game was configured to 4K. But remember that DLSS changes how this resolution really behaves. Ultra performance with path tracing yielded a 93 FPS average with frame generation off, but ultra performance looks terrible. You'd be better off with almost any other option. Path tracing on DLSS quality and frame generation on got us to a playable 66 FPS average. It's not bad. The lows were fine here as well. If you really hated frame generation though, you could go to DLSS balanced with path tracing and still hit 50 FPS average in our test scenario. But it's starting to dip into unpleasant territory in terms of game feel, and path tracing in particular starts to feel especially bad when there are heavier drops in frame rate. The rest of the results are on here as well, but you get the idea. Uh, frame generation really is kind of needed for this particular game, and even DLSS quality without frame gen only lands you at 40 FPS average. All right, for comparison, we chose some specific scenes and took screenshots with different variations of ray tracing, psycho ray tracing, ultra, no ray tracing, whatever. And we locked all the other settings in with preset values. Specifically, we used a, a high ultra combination. Our first image comparison will find us in the club. Bottle full of bub. Look, Ada, I got RTX if you into tracing rays. But before we reveal which shot is which, we're going to do a blind test so you can sort of calibrate yourself for biases. Currently, we're showing a split screen with three different images. One of them is without ray tracing or path tracing. One is with path tracing. And one is with the more traditional ray tracing solution. With only this image, try to decide which is which. We'll show them each full screen briefly as well, but take a look and come to a conclusion on which one you think is path traced specifically. So, now that you've got an idea for which one you think is path traced, we're going to go back to the three-way split screen and reveal them. Post in the comments and let us know if you got it right. No shame in being wrong here. It's just a fun test to identify what your own expectations are so you can adjust them for the technology. With that done, here's the comparison proper. Starting with this club interior, there's a huge difference between the baseline screenshot with no RT versus the one with RT Ultra. Without indirect lighting bouncing off of the floor, the white pillars throughout the room appear black, as actually does the rear wall above the reflective window. Ray tracing also allows for sharp reflections on that window, as well as more subtle reflections under the chairs at the bar without streaky screen space effect artifact type images. This is all stuff we've seen before though. RT Psycho is mostly indistinguishable from Ultra in this scene, although there are some changes in the lighting, for example, of the ceiling mounted decorations, 
With path tracing enabled, though, the scene is overall brighter when compared to RT Ultra. Whether or not that's better is kind of a different discussion, but that's the main effect. The shadows under the wall-mounted AC almost completely disappear here, and the round seats and vending machines are lit from below by light reflected from the floor. At least that part makes sense. It's brighter, but again, it's hard to objectively judge if that means better, in the same way sharpness doesn't necessarily mean better. This is especially true when considering the lighting in the original non-ray traced screenshot, which we'll show again, was probably already manually tuned by artists to look the way they wanted it to. We would say it's an improvement on the surface of the bar though, at the very least, where both the drinks and the man sitting at the bar are lit from below. Note also that there's no change in the reflective glass window as the particles and glass are still handled the same way that they were previously. Next image, this plaza provides a ton of lighting variety with half the scene covered in sunlight and the other half in shadow with illuminated signs. With Psycho RT, the NCART sign to the right and the triangular M logo above it, cast a glow on the walls behind them, and the reflections in the glass windows across the street are accurate to the objects they mirror. Moving to path tracing, the sidewalk across the street becomes brighter and reflects light back up onto the trash cans and benches above. The most dramatic change is the shadow cast across the center of the screen by the buildings on the right side of the street. The row of buildings facing us is much darker here. Next up, neon signs over wet streets are an obvious go-to, but a really bright and sunny outdoor scene gives us a totally different test case. Starting with a comparison between no ray tracing and ray tracing on Ultra, there are several shadows on the surface of the satellite dishes that don't exist at all without ray tracing. The shadows that do exist, like the one on the lowermost dish, are far sharper with RT and dark areas like the underside of the uppermost dishes are indirectly lit. Adding RT Psycho to the comparison against RT Ultra, we see once again that RT Psycho is nearly indistinguishable. And moving from RT Psycho to path tracing isn't a massive change here, but the undersides of all the objects, so the solar panels, the Joshua trees, the triangular platform at the center of the tower, all of those are lit from below by reflections from the desert surface. But if there's any scene where extra light bounces look appropriate, it's midday in the desert. Next up is the parade scene. Ray tracing has less of an effect on this set piece than we expected here. This is clearly a scene that artists spent a lot of manual effort on specifically. And as a result, the main differences between no RT and RT Psycho end up being the reflective surface of the barge. The building in the background also gains some definition with lighting from the dragon. The brightness of the building in the background is also the main difference when moving from RT Psycho to the new path tracing, while the bird at the front of the barge is darker with path tracing. And this is a scene we handpicked from memory as one that should have some really incredible path tracing, but instead, it served as a demonstration, educationally, that the artists have already done a good job with traditional light placement in manually tuned scenes where they want a specific effect. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that DLSS is required at this point to make the game playable with path tracing at 4K. As confirmed by NVIDIA, the costs of path tracing and RTX GI are directly proportional to the input resolution of DLSS. Path tracing becomes more expensive for every pixel rendered, and DLSS renders fewer pixels. In theory, enabling DLSS directly hurts the quality of path tracing, but let's look at whether it's noticeable. Here's a comparison image. The loss of overall detail is noticeable in some areas, most significantly with the more patterns on the illuminated sleeve of the woman leaning against the support beam to the left. Some other fine details, like the stripes on the front of the barricade, are muddied. In terms of lighting, though, there's no appreciable difference. We know for a fact that the lighting on the neon signs in the background and the shadows, which cover the pedestrians on the right, are strongly affected by RT settings. But DLSS doesn't make those aspects look any worse, even when stepping down from quality to balanced, which we also captured, or even all the way down to performance. There are other losses with DLSS, like flicker and fences and wires, but that's unrelated to the path tracing here. Recapping the benchmarks then, this was pretty simple. Path tracing still requires DLSS if you're gonna play at higher resolution. So 4K, not happening uh, on the 4090 at least. 20 FPS average is what you're gonna get with higher graphic settings. And you start tweaking the graphic settings down or the resolution down too much. And at some point, it's, it's kind of like, okay, so you've path traced it and it's playable, but at what cost?
and it becomes a little silly. So DLSS is effectively required here uh, for this update. If you have anything that's not a 4090, uh, it's definitely required, and it, even then it still might not really work. We'd have to test it separately, but we'll maybe look at that later. Now, DLSS, the next question is if I have to turn it on, what am I losing there? We looked a little bit, and uh, in this instance, it didn't really affect the lighting that much. We thought it would have a bigger impact on the results of path tracing because NVIDIA noted to us explicitly that the pixel count influences the path tracing quality. And so if you have a lower input resolution or even lower output resolution, it should be affected negatively. But for the lighting elements, we didn't see that much of a downside to DLSS. The places you'll see it are in similar places to Final Fantasy XV back in the day where you have maybe flickering with something like a fence or a, a really thin object where you get sort of the jagged edges or the jaggies um, that don't play well with uh, when you're trying to recreate more information from basically no information. So that's where we saw the downsides. Ultimately though, in terms of what they're actually doing here, it's a big change from Quake 2. So uh, there's some subjectivity involved here. We try to stay as objective as we can. We point out the differences to you and then it's kind of up to you to decide, but we've got a couple thoughts and uh, I'll share the, the team's thoughts with you all. So where image quality is concerned, it's a mixed bag, highly dependent on the scene that you're looking at. Not a big surprise and the elements in that scene. So sometimes, for example, path tracing lends a more natural look versus all of the other settings, like on the underside of the distant solar panels in that outdoor tower scene. Another positive, albeit extremely subtle, is the roll off of the reflection from the right to the left in the glass panels to the left of the blue karaoke sign in the plaza scene. On the other hand, there are some strange changes that we read as unintentional side effects of CD Projekt Red having to tweak all the lights for the new mode. If we look back at the same plaza scene, the vertical red sign near the center of the screen is much more intense than in other modes, and it sort of blooms profusely. You can see the changes to the intensity of light all over the place in path tracing mode when you look hard enough. And so comes the subjective side that we won't get too deep into, but to raise the question, uh, it's basically what was the general mood or the original intent of the artists? And, if they were building the game without ray tracing at all at the beginning, probably they made it look the way they want. That doesn't mean ray tracing can't improve it, but it does mean that there has to be, on the opposite end, manual tuning of RT or path tracing to, again, get that desired result. So back in the club scene, the AC unit and the surrounding wall on the right of the image is by far the brightest in path tracing mode. Multiple brighter elements here make it give off a vibe much more sterile than the darker details of the RT off scene. So sometimes you get that blown out look, almost like an overexposure or excessive bloom, but not everywhere. It, it really is scene to scene. Uh, and the frame rate is by far the more encumbering thing to have to deal with. Overall then, I think sometimes with this kind of stuff, people expect us to write with all this glowing and flowery adjectives and praise and talking about how beautiful it is or something. It's not really our style. We look at the technology, and technologically, this is a really impressive early implementation of path tracing on something that is much more complex than the prior implementations of real-time path tracing for a video game. There are downsides to performance, it's playable with DLSS, and there are times that it doesn't look good or it doesn't really work right, we explained a few of those, but overall, this is considered a preview, and they're not selling it, so fair play to them. On the image quality side, we never get into subjectives too much. It's not really what we're here for or why people like us. However, once again, technologically, being able to trace or bounce more rays uh, while also being able to render a theoretical unlimited amount of lights in a scene while still being technically playable with, say, DLSS, that's a pretty good starting point. But you basically need an RTX 40 card to get to a place where it's playable, and even then, our 4090 was struggling. And when you retroactively add that to the game, it's going to require a lot more work to get it uh, looking good. So hence the careful use of the terminology technology preview. We thought we'd look at it, do some testing, and check it out. That's it for this one. Thanks, as always, for watching. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersaccess.net if you'd like to grab one of our project and solder mats. And we'll see you all next time.